terrified of them actually, so I would watch everything I could about them and watch Discovery Channel's Storm Chasers. Well, two of the people on it, their goal was to get hit by the tornado and it took one guy eight years to accomplish that of actively trying. So I was like, okay, what am I that afraid of? And I've always wanted to see one from far and photograph it, so I found someone to take me out. My first tornado, I was hooked. So it was the greatest thing. Uh, I'm a cannon shooter. Here's my equipment up here. I have a 7D, which is great for um, chasing because it's weather sealed. So a lot of the times I'm out in the rain, it's not that bad for it. I don't like throw it in the water and get it absolutely soaking wet, but it holds up pretty well. Um, the main thing I use when I'm shooting storms is my wide angle, my 10 to 18. Um, I had the Tanron 10 to 24. I really didn't like it. Um, I ended up cracking that lens, one of my best chase days also. Um, I always shoot basically at 10 millimeters. I like to shoot wide. I like to get close and shoot wide. Um, I have the 70 to 200 2.8. I used once on a chase. When I first did this presentation, I had the 200 to 500, and I said I had never used it. But that changed April 9th of 2015. Um, the Rochelle tornado, I had to use it on because I was way too far away from that. And I had to use it at 500, so it's kind of ridiculous to me. <laughs> um, I use a remote trigger. It's not a lightning trigger. They're not the same thing, and I think lightning triggers are cheating. Um, tripod when you want to do lightning. Um, that's about the only time I use my tripod, because I'm too all over the place. I'm go, go, go all the time, so I can't have the tripod hold me back. Um, I use Lightroom and Photoshop for my post-processing. Uh, the radar that I use on my phone is called Radar Scope, and on the laptop it's GR Level 3. It's what the meteorologists use. It shows all sorts of different levels of the radar, so you can see rotation, you can see hail, you can see everything you can possibly know about storms on there. GPS, I no longer use my Mustang because I just got rid of it a couple weeks ago. I'm really sad about that. I haven't took my Jeep chasing yet, but I will, and it'll be a lot easier for me. So a few days ahead of the chase, I'm constantly looking at weather models. Every day I read the weather models. Um, this is an Outlook. They have changed it up a little bit since then. They've added an extra category besides these that you see here. Um, this gives you a general idea where the storms is. This map is for November 17, 2013. That's when we had the Washington tornado um, and a bunch of other tornadoes on, in the state. This was the most, the, the most updated outlook for that day and they gave a high risk that's the highest that they put up there and when you see a high risk you <coughs> have to be weather ready you have to watch the weather it's going to be significant even a moderate risk very significant um, they don't put those out too often but those are my favorite things to chase not so much high risk because it usually turns into a cluster and a very dangerous crazy situation um, the day of the chase I'm still looking at the weather outlooks I'm looking at all the different, um, there's a whole bunch of different things to look at. The Outlook, which has those different risks that I had said. There's weather statements, which are within the one to two hour range of what's going to happen right around that time. Um, mesoscale discussions come out right before they put up watches. They give us an area of um, concern and say why they're going to put up a watch or why they might not put up a watch but to watch this area. Um, Radar and satellite, always. This is the GR Level 3 on the laptop. Um, this is the normal radar people are used to. This is how you see if it's rotating. The red and green, when they get next to each other, it's spinning. Um, this dot is my location to the storm, and it's in a little hook. And if you see something hooking like that, it's indicative of the storm rotating and pulling in rain around it. Um, so this is where the tornado would be in this storm. This is all the rain. Um, if you guys have ever wondered what a radar looks like, it's this. So if you ever drive around and see these, that's the National Weather Service radars. Um, this one I think is Nebraska's. They had two supercells behind it and a million mosquitoes. So bug spray if you go chasing, um, which I didn't have, so it was kind of a miserable night. But um, red obviously is really heavy rain. Orange is intermediate. Green's light rain. Blue is just 
Right or junk, I call it. Um, then there's a satellite which shows just the clouds. Because before the storms are there, you don't see it on the radar until it's a big storm. But while they're growing, you can see the clouds on the satellite to, to know, OK, storms are starting, you can get in that spot. Next. Um, there's two different things they always put out. There's watches and warnings. A lot of people seem to get them confused. Um, a watch is for a big area. Um, these are tornado watches. This green dot or this blue dot to me in between two tornado watches. I was not doing very well at that point. Um, but the watch will go for a big area saying either conditions are right for severe thunderstorms in this area or for torna or tornadoes in this area. Um, they'll usually be a couple hours in, in length. Um, warnings are more significant. They're put out, I think they usually set warnings for about 45 minutes. They, of course, expire once the storm leaves. Um, but this would be an example of a warning. This red box is a tornado warning. Uh, here's my dot. This is the day I got my first Illinois tornado. This is right before I lost data. And this, again, is the, the um, circulation. So the green and red next to each other, the tornado was right there. Um, so that's how I know where to go when I'm watching the radar. Um, these orange boxes are, right, are warnings, but they're severe thunderstorm warnings. Um, when you have a severe watch of any kind or a tornado watch, you guys got to watch the weather, get your warnings, uh, have your radios by you, have a plan, um, because at any point in time, it can turn into a warning. Sometimes things get bad before warning can even be issued, so you really have to watch the weather. Obviously, watches, watch for it. Warning means take action. So I'll start with thunderstorms. Um, thunderstorms have lightning. Lightning makes the thunder, which is why they're called thunderstorms. Um, they're just normal rain showers. They're not rotating. Um, that's the big thing. People go into super, call everything a supercell. Everything's not a supercell because not everything rotates while it grows. When you see clouds start like this, this is how they start. See the big puffy cauliflower looking clouds? That's the start of a thunderstorm. This down here is the base. Um, but it rapidly grows on a hot summer day and then it can just as fast die. That's what these did. They grew and then they rained on themselves, died. And then they grew again, rained on themselves, and died. Um, they can turn severe um, at any point in time. And the severe criteria is one inch hail and 58 mile an hour winds. And 58 is literally what they say. I don't know why it's 58 and not 55 or not 60, but 58 is what they classify as severe. So if it has one or the other, they'll severe warn it and tell you why it's a severe warning. I'll go next. Here's some examples. Uh, this is actually at that place you were talking about. That's St. James Preserve right down the street in Bartlett, because I, I work right down the street. Well, no, no, that's uh, Pete Phillips. Yeah, that's, St. James is down this is where the nature center is, basically. Um, so I was driving home from work and saw the, the storm start to go up. And I'm like, OK, I'll sit and watch. Um, again, they would build up. And then they would die really fast. But I like to put my Mustang in a lot of pictures. You'll see a lot of pictures of this car. <laughs> Um, because I just, to me, I like more than just one subject in the photo. If it's just the clouds, okay. If you had something else interesting and there is something else I like, I'll like it a lot more. Because anybody can go out and take a picture of the cloud. A lot of people do. So I like to do, be different. You can go next. This is another thunderstorm. This whole thing is a thunderstorm. The top is the anvil coming out. This is a very mature thunderstorm. This was in Nebraska in 2012. Most of the time I'm chasing, I'm not driving. Uh, so don't worry, <laughs> I'm not taking these while I drive. I'm usually like hanging out the window taking pictures, but um, while other people are driving. So for these kind of pictures, if they're in a moving vehicle, which is a lot of time what you're gonna be doing, you don't just sit around once storms are going. Um, I have higher ISO because I'm not worried about noise. I can always fix noise later. The thing I'm worried about is shutter speed. If you have a grainy photo, you could fix that. If you have too slow shutter speed, you can't go back and fix that afterwards. And you can't redo the shots because it's a one-time thing, which is probably one of the things I like most about storm chasing. You can't redo it. I can't pause and be like, hey, just stay there. It doesn't work that way. Um, so you want a fast shutter speed. If you're in a moving vehicle, at least 250th. Most of the time, higher. So if you have to raise your ISO, raise it up. I always have the aperture as wide as it can go. On my 10 millimeter, it's 3.5. Um, so if you have a 2.8, that's even better. So you can use a lower ISO. But watch your shutter speed. That's the most important thing. You cannot redo 
a really shaky photo. This is another, um, this is a dying storm. I went all the way to Colorado because it's supposed to be this big day. And this happens a lot, they hype it up and it's supposed to be great. And then one little thing ends up missing that day and you don't get what's forecasted. So the tornadic threat completely died. Um, so this is just a line of storms coming. These rain shafts look really cool. This is a bunch of rain and hail. Um, I went and shot a panel, which is what I do a lot. I'll shoot wide and I don't shoot the panel in landscape mode, I put it in portrait. Because one of my favorite pictures I ever took was a shelf cloud. It was awesome. And I panoed it in landscape mode. So when I stitched it together, it chopped more of the top and more of the bottom off than I wanted. So if you do portrait mode, or portrait orientation, all the extra stuff on the top and bottom won't matter when you go and crop your picture. Um, so I did that. I hate this. I tried to remove it. It doesn't work right. Um, and I wasn't going to go in this because like two minutes before that storm came up, I ran up to the field and I saw this little squiggly thing on the road. I thought it was a stick. It's not a stick. It was a little, a little snake. And it had a little black thing. It was like, I didn't know what it was. So I stuck my camera in its face and I'm taking pictures of it and sticking its tongue out at me. And then I was like, all right, I give up. I'm going to shoot the storm. Well, now that I saw that, and they're like, that's a rattlesnake, don't touch that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was like, yep, I'm not going in there, because all those are probably still in there. So if I were to feel comfortable going in this to get away from whatever might have been there, I would have done that. It's hard to get these power lines out. Try to watch that in your storms pictures. So if you can get on the other side of them, so you don't have to Photoshop them out, it's the best. But don't go in grass where there might be rattlesnakes. <laughs> you can go next. Um, this is just, so we shot it from far and we let it catch up to us. This is about the only cool storm of the day and then after that it was all going to be a mess so we basically gave up chasing for the day. So this was shot at 10 millimeters, we let it come up to us, took a couple shots, got in the car and got poured on. But they usually don't look that wispy and pretty. So it was a nice shot. Mm -hmm. next. Um, another thunderstorm, um, this is all hail that you see. And the rainbow, they call that a hail bow when it's a rainbow in the hail. Um, you can see the big, um, a lot of times storms when they start, they build around each other. So you'll see the new building storm and the, all the stuff behind it's already a mature storm. And they just like basically eat each other and grow into one big massive complex of storms. But again, my friend was driving and I'm shooting out the window. High shutter speed, higher ISO, low aperture. Next. This I really liked. Um, this was unexpected. I was with a friend um, at a friend's house most of the day because the storm chances just kind of were meh, so I didn't really care. And coming home, we'd passed this, so I made him stop. And I was like, well, I want to shoot the dying mammatus and the dying storm. There has a, there's a rainbow in there, too. It's hard to see. And I love color in my photos. It's one of the things I do a lot. Do a lot is just enhance the color. I love colorful photos. Um, so I make sure I have lots of color in my photos. Um, I love little structures, little farms, little houses. So I, again, wanted to have more in my photo than just the storm. Again, another car shot with my storm. You can actually see me taking the picture. So the sun was behind me. This storm had started. And you can see it's toppling over. It's dying because it's basically raining on itself. It didn't have enough uh, ventilation. Because you want the storm to vent and rain outwards and not rain down back on itself because once the cold hits it, it chokes itself off and dies. You're not gonna get anything good. Um, you get this though, the dying storm with the, the rainbow and so I got on a country road and took a panel of it. Now this doesn't look that bad up here. A lot of times I do this and this comes out all like bad colored and um, the sky really did look like this. I didn't over enhance this at all. Um, the whole entire sky was pink. So we had given up on the storms because they had just congealed again. And I wanted to shoot lightning, so we flew ahead of it and waited for it to come to us because we wanted it to be dark. Uh, but then it started lighting up. And then once that was all said and done, all the lightning died and then passed us and then started again. So <laughs> that's what storms love to do. So we shot lightning from far afterwards, but this was definitely my favorite shot. This is six shots together, I think. Because I literally, I don't put it on a tripod because Photoshop's really good. I just shoot straight as I can and when they stitch it, it'll move it a little bit. That's why you want to have the extra on top and bottom to be able to chop off and not lose what you have. Because if I would have shot it this way, this would have like chopped 
the top off and the bottom off, and you don't want to do that. Next. So supercells. Supercells are the kind of storm I like to go after because they're the kind that rotate, and they're the ones that tornadoes come out of. Um, it's only a supercell if it's rotating. Not every storm's a supercell like everybody loves to call it. Um, they're usually, well, they can turn severe and cause damage. They usually do turn severe. Um, like I said, they can, they can produce a tornado and they usually have hail. From it rotating, the rain droplets go back up in updraft and keep cycling. And the more strong an updraft you have, the bigger the hail is. And it, it keeps recycling until it can't hold it anymore and it drops its hail. Um, those are the really massive 50,000 foot supercells that are really fun. So here's some hail. This is quarter sized hail. This is what the criteria from the NWS is to put out a severe thunderstorm warning. Um, it's an inch, it, it is the size of a quarter. They do hurt when they hit you. I've gotten hit by plenty of uh, quarter sized hail. So I can see why I guess they'd be called severe. Next. And this is another piece of, uh, that's my hand by the way, and I'm, I'm holding this piece of hail. And this is a couple minutes after it fell, so it's already melted a little bit. Um, this was in Chana, Illinois and this was back in 2013. And that storm I had dropped out of and I didn't get hit by the hail. But we saw it after it passed by and it was huge. Next. That's definitely... This hit my car. <laughs> this is baseball size hail again. This was November, the no November 17th of 2013. The guy I chased with, uh, he was one of the guys from the Discovery Channel. He loves hail. His car looks like a golf ball. That's just what it looks like. Me, on the other hand, I hate hail. I don't want it on my, well, I don't hate it. I don't want it on my car. Uh, and he tried to keep me out of it, but the GR level three isn't always perfect. And it didn't show big hail. So a couple of the storms were really big. So when I started hearing it, I'm just like, great. So we had to sit and wait for the storm to pass by. And I picked it up and I looked at him. I was like, Tony, really? He goes, I gotta keep that. I'm like, here you go. So some of, sometimes they keep them and they do, they send them places for scientific data and research. Um, there's people that just solely chase just to get huge hail. So airplane companies and other companies that can get really affected by hail, study them. The next. This is the supercells from that radar uh, image I showed earlier. Here's two separate ones. You can see in this picture really well that it, it's spinning. You can see the striations. This one's venting really nicely and coming out this way and basically raining on this one. Um, you can see the lowerings that they produce when they spin. Um, here's another lowering right there. About 20 minutes later, this supercell ate this one, blew up, made a tornado, but by the time we could stop to take a picture, tornado dissipated. So I have no pictures of the tornado, but got to see the tornado at least. And that usually happens a lot when I chase, it seems. Um, so once they're at night, it's just a big pain. Um, definitely don't chase at night if you don't know what you're doing, because it's very dangerous. Um, even when you do know, know what you're doing, I chase way farther back than I usually do. This is another supercell. This were basically right underneath. Um, that's why the top got cut off. I did pano it in the portrait orientation. Um, you can't see it, but there's a bunch of hail on here. This is the car I was in. This is some other friends that had stopped. Um, this storm looked really nice. It was spinning really, really nicely and then dissipated. It had a lot of nice lightning. Once all the, the hail came to us, we got in the car for a little bit, and then once it passed us, we shot it. But it didn't last long. The thermodynamics weren't very good that day either. Let's see the next. Um, this was a nice Nebraska or Kansas supercell. Um, this is another panel because I like big picture. I like to show the whole scene. Um, about five minutes after I took this shot, a bunch of my friends came flying up the street. I think 10 of them had lost their windshield because all that green, that's all hail. And they went through that, they core punched. It's not a safe thing to do, but sometimes if you're in the wrong spot, you have to, to get down to the right end to see the tornado. Um, it's hard to see, but this is a lowering and this is a little funnel. This made a tornado that lasted literally not even a minute. Because by the time I wanted to take my wide angle lens off to put my um, telephoto, it dissipated. So. Uh, you have to be fast. I would suggest chasing with two cameras if you can, one with a wide angle and one with a long lens on. I haven't done that yet, but I will be after I keep missing these tornadoes that I do all the time because um, they're not they're not long. Sometimes, okay, so a radar scan takes five minutes to complete. So radar updates every five minutes. 
So the NWS needs people out there like us that spot storms, that chase storms, to tell them what's actually happening. Like that tornado that came down and was a minute long and went back up before the radar could even catch it. Um, so radar is not perfect. You can't always just base everything off radar. You do need ground truth, which is why storm spotters are important. This is another supercell. This was basically scraping the ground. That's how nicely it was rotating. It was tornado warned. Um, this was late October because in the fall we have a secondary severe season. It's usually only about one week or one big storm system. Um, the corn's 10,000 feet tall in Iowa. So I went and got on my friend's truck bed and I set up my tripod so I can see what that looked like. It was worn and we had that on radar, but you still can't tell. It was very hard. Although it looks like it's on the ground, they didn't have enough damage or anything hit to tell whether it was a tornado or not. The next. This um, is a huge, huge rotating wall cloud. This whole thing was spinning, and this part is where the tornado would come down. It wouldn't obviously be that wide, at least right away. So it comes down. This whole thing was spinning. It was really nice. This was right before my uh, first Illinois tornado. You could see the area I was chasing in is not the best. Over by the Galena area, it's all trees. So there's no data. Um, and there's very little view of anything because all you have is trees. Um, so if you ever plan on chasing in Illinois and you want to chase alone or you want to make your first chase, don't go up to northwest Illinois. You don't want all those trees. Central Illinois is probably the best area for chasing. It's nice and flat, nice gridded roads. Everyone's like, oh, Oklahoma, half of Oklahoma's trees. Same thing with half of Kansas, and their roads are so far and so few in between. If all the good storms could be in central Illinois, that'd be a chaser's dream, but it doesn't always work that way. Thanks. This is another supercell. This, is, again, is another rotating wall cloud. I got a tornado shortly after this pic uh, picture. You'll see that in a couple slides up. Um, this is when I'm a little bit closer. I don't like to be so far away to get big st structure shots. I like to be closer. Sometimes you miss things. Once the rain wraps around it, if you're not really close to it, you might not be able to see it. Um, especially in these Nebraska supercells that have a lot of precipitation. So they just turn messy really fast. So you kind of want to get there right when they start, hope for the best, then back off because they just turn into a mess. It's another uh, part of a rotating wall cloud. It's kind of hard to see. I wasn't standing on the tracks for a whole long time. Um, we had pulled over, I got a shot, and I went. Um, because we had to keep with the storm. You don't have a whole lot of time to just stand there and shoot for hours, obviously, because it's moving. Um, go on. This is another muddy Nebraska supercell. See, this all this rain and hail, I had actually there was a tornado in this storm maybe 20 minutes after I took this picture, and it was so wrapped in all this rain that it literally popped out of it for about 20 seconds. And with the horrible contrast, my camera lens wouldn't focus on it at all, so I don't even have a picture of it. But you can see how big they are, because this is shot at 10 and panoed, and this is my chase partner at the time, um, just standing down there to show the sheer size of it. It's pretty awesome to stand there, but all the wind, you can see all the, the grass coming into it. The storm sucks all the hot air into it to power itself. So when you're standing there shooting a storm, you, I'm literally like this and bracing because all the air is getting sucked in and it's pulling you too. I've had some storms in Nebraska where if I were to fall, I think my camera and a whole bunch of other things would get sucked into it because it was, it was strong. And, but you want that for a nice storm. The stronger the inflow, the bigger the storm and the better the pictures can come out sometimes. This was actually that storm I was just talking about where you're standing there and it's sucking in so much air and, and just power that it's hard to stand. All this dark green, that's huge hail. There was a tornado out of the storm too. Um, you'll see a picture from it. But this is what they call an HP mess, a high precipitation supercell. And that's what most of them end up being. Um, very rarely will you get a low precipitation supercell, but those are the nice pretty round ones that aren't wrapped in rain and they're very shapely but you don't see them as awesome often. Here we go. Now this actually was by Rochelle, Illinois. This kind of thing you don't usually see in Illinois either. This is a decent structure. Funny thing about this is I wasn't paying attention to weather at all this day. 
and we were out and about in Hoffman Estates and it was pouring and I am a storm chaser that hates rain. It sound, as silly as that sounds, I hate rain. I don't like being in the rain. I don't like dealing with it. So I open my radar to see will the rain end soon and I see a nice big mesoscale discussion. So I read it and they're talking about putting a tornado watch out west. So I was like, alrighty, we just ordered our food, but I'm going to need it to go. We got to go. So we left Hoffman Estates and went down to Rochelle. Um, and on my GR level three, you can see where you are compared to the storm. It'll have a bunch of little dots on it. So your friends can click the dots and see who's around the storm and go on their Facebook and see what they're looking at, basically. So I got tagged in a couple posts saying, I wonder where Lorraine sees. So I took a cell phone shot and I stuck it up there and everyone was like, what? This whole thing spins. It was really nice. And this was wrapping up really nicely too. And I thought, okay, I'll get a tornado. It'll be right there. It's going to be great. And then it died. All it has to do is just go a couple miles more into un favorable conditions and just choke itself out and dissipate. Um, but it looked really nice for a couple minutes, which is sometimes all the time you have, so you really have to, to be in the right spot. You really, like I said, need to watch your shutter speed. I'm not afraid of high ISO, anything to get the correct shutter speed. Um, and the shutter speed obviously is if you're standing still and you have enough light, which is not very often when it comes to storms, it's usually really dark. Um, sun usually goes away, so you need high ISO, wide open aperture, and high, higher shutter speed so you don't blur. This one, I used to live in St. Charles. That storm looked pretty nice, and I like to shoot the sunset also. So I went up on top of one of the parking garages, and this looks, you can see, it's dying. When it starts just being wispy like that, that's a dying storm. So it took me five minutes to get home and five minutes to look at the radar and that thing had went tornado worn and it made a tornado in Lake County. Two weeks after I did my presentation up there telling everybody, doesn't matter where you live, tornadoes can and will happen. So it literally went right by where I did that camera club presentation. It went out into Lake Michigan, a nice water spout that was really sad for missing. But that dying little storm, which you would never have thought would do anything, just hit a, a nice patch of environment and blew up and spun and came down and it's all it takes. Um, so storm chasing is a lot of luck. You have to keep going. You don't win if you don't try. That's, and, and even all of the, the time and money and effort that us storm chasers put into this, all the best video we ever see is these people in their backyards going like this. Oh, the tornado's coming to my house. And I'm just like, it's frustrating. But that's, that's really, it's, you gotta be in the right spot in the right time. It's not always easy. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is linear storms. This is what we see most of in Illinois, where you have the huge line of storms that go throughout the whole entire state. Um, this right here, since so it's bowing out, it's called a bow echo. This is a really strong storm. Um, this was the day the Hawks won the second to last championship. So I think it was June 6th or June 8th of 2013 or 14. I just come back from that Colorado storm, and I literally had four hours of sleep. I came back at noon, wanted to watch the championship game, Woke up at four, and I woke up at four and saw this tornado warning line. They had four tornado warnings when it was in the Illinois Iowa border. I was like, all right, guess I gotta go. So I went down 38. All right, this is my dot, and these are all these little dots. If I were to click on these on my phone, it tells me who these people are. So I can see who's here and who's looking at the storm here, and, and I can message them and be like, what does it look like there? So it's fun. Um, you can see it's hooking out. So I wanted to get in that spot because if it made a tornado, I'd have a brief chance to see it. Um, by the time I got up to it, that died. And I had a nice shelf cloud, but I just let it ran, run me over and I went on to give up on it and watch the Hawks win the championship, so that was even better. Next. So, shelf clouds come from linear storms. Um, what it is is the gust front out in front of it. It's the cold air rushing out in front, which makes the, the cloud lower. And it's what everybody sees and they freak out and they think it's a tornado or a wall cloud. It's not the same thing. It's always confused. Shelf cloud and wall cloud are not the same. Very high winds come with the shelf cloud. Um, you'll see the awesome cloud come at you. You'll be nice and calm. The minute it goes over you, that's when the wind starts. You get instantly hit with a bunch of rain. Um, so if you're going to shoot shelf clouds, don't be far away from your car. Um, I always try to position myself right in the center of it bowing, because then you'll have the whole entire thing in the picture. It'll look really nice. Um, but like I said, my car is never far away because the minute it passes you by, you're getting poured on. Um, next. So this is a shelf cloud. Um, I've always wanted a picture of a shelf cloud coming over the lake. This was on 
the Michigan side, I was waterspout hunting this day. When you're hunting waterspouts, it's freezing cold. It's about 33 degrees outside because you need the cold air over the warm lake to get the water spout. Uh, so the last thing I want to do is get poured on by this. So I was really lucky. It came up the shore and just rode the shore north. It didn't even hit the beach, and I was really happy about that. Um, but this is, I think, South Haven Lighthouse, because um, that's where I was this day. But that's just the front end of the storm. It looks mean. It's not a tornado. It's not a wall cloud. They can have tornadoes in them. You won't see them because they'll be wrapped in rain. Go next. Here's another shelf cloud. I took my fiance to shoot this. This is the first thing in the morning. I was watching the storm come through, and I was like, all right, we got to get, and I'm not, I'm not a morning person. I hate being up in the morning. If you have a storm, lightning, thunder, I'll be right up, like I've been up for days. So I, we came over to here. This was downtown St. Charles, where I shot a lot. Um, and I stood there, and I'm waiting, and I am told him, OK, well, what are you going to shoot? He's like, oh, I'll figure it out when I get here. I go, you don't have time for that. And he didn't take me seriously. Because it comes and it goes. You're literally, you have this in your view for maybe a couple minutes. So you have to get there well ahead of time and you have to look around and think about what will look cool. I don't just go out and take pictures of the shelf cloud itself. I like to take pictures of stuff with the shelf cloud. So again, it's different and it's more interesting to me at least. Um, so I, I, what I do is I don't stay in one spot either. I'll shoot here, then I'll run down there. I, I even went down here, I came over here, I went over here and shot it again because you can't do this again. This, the storm's not going to pause. You can't go and redo the storm. So you want to have as many shots as you can. So move a lot. And again, shoot portrait orientation so you don't chop everything off. Go next. Redo it someday, but I got the shelf cloud with it. Nobody else has that picture. Um, again, I wanted to have something with the shelf cloud and something different than everybody else that shoots this. Go next. Again, I like my car, and I like shelf cloud. So I wanted the picture of my, my car, me, and a shelf cloud. So I did that. So I had my trigger on my tripod, and I took the first three shots. And then I jumped into the picture, took a couple shots. Then I jumped out and finished the pano, and I stitched it together afterwards. Um, again, this is all rain and hail, and this is the shelf cloud. Go next. Now this was pure luck, because I did the same thing, only without paneling it, and I just wanted a couple shots. I got lucky and lightning struck, and I was really excited about that, because I love lightning. So there's a lot of things I like in this picture. Um, all in one, so I always take multiple shots, because that also helps. One. Now this is the shelf cloud. That was my favorite shelf cloud I've ever saw and shot in or er, landscape. So this is actually a little bit taller, but it chopped it off, and I had more ground, Actually, this I was able to fix in Photoshop, but it wanted to chop it to about here um, because I didn't put it in portrait. And to give the size of this, that little brown thing right over here is one of those huge pavilions that holds like 10 or 12 tables under it. And you can see how small it looks compared to this gigantic cloud. Um, this actually knocked power out around here for a couple days. Um, it was very unexpected. I'm glad I'm stopped. I stayed at a friend's house in Burlington. So I was waiting for the storm to come out of uh, Wisconsin, and it was like moving snail's pace. I wanted to shoot lightning. That's what I was waiting for. Um, come 5.30 in the morning when the sun started to come up, I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm not shooting lightning, so I'm going to go home. And as I'm going home, I pass by my area. I shoot storms. I open the radar, and now that storm's halfway across Illinois now. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just look, because what do I have to lose? And I'm glad I did, because as it came closer, it just grew bigger and bigger. And I really felt like I could just reach up and touch it. That's how low it was. This thing had trees bending and garbage cans flying. And it was kind of fun to watch after it passed by me. I got in my car, and I'm sitting there, and it's rocking. And I'm just like, yeah, fun drive home after I start to drive. But I'm going to go next. And another size comparison, there's the Mustang with it while it's passing over it. It literally felt like you couldn't just grab it. It was the coolest shelf cloud I'd ever seen, and I hadn't seen one better yet. But I hope one day to shoot, to shoot it the right way next, day, next time I do. We'll go next. It's another shelf cloud. We were at water spout hunting. This guy didn't seem to really care about what was coming, and I had to really tell him about four times that this is going to be bad, please get off the rocks. And he finally did. He finally started following me back as I'm dry, uh, walking. But it's another pano because um, I like the big picture. That was a failed water spout day. Once it starts doing this, you're not going to get water spouts, so I just gave up on it. 
too much rain, you wouldn't see them the next time. So this is a shot I've always wanted. I always take pictures of the windmill in Batavia, I like, or uh, St. Geneva. I really like it, and I've always wanted to get a shelf club coming over it. But the way it's facing and the way it's oriented, it's a really hard thing to do. This storm was in a very specific spot to be able to get this shot. So I got off work a little early, so my boss knows my craziness about storms. He let me off, and I came here. So I shot from here. I came and shot it from this direction. I went down and shot it in that direction. I shot it about six different ways. So every time I go out to shoot something that even only lasts about 10 minutes, I'll come out with two or 300 photos of it, just because you can delete them. If it doesn't matter when you're shooting digital. That's what I love about it. You can take as many shots as you want. You don't like, get rid of it. Um, but it'd be hard to recreate this photo because I would have to wait for the storm to be in that weird position again that's not normally in that position. So I'm happy that I got that. And this is the one I like the most out of the five different setups I had. It's another shelf cloud. Um, that one's not that impressive. Um, it really wasn't that strong of a storm, but it sometimes can look cool. On all the shelf clouds I always pan on. So even if you have a 10 millimeter, to me it's not wide enough. It's actually, this was June 29th of 2012. This was another first thing in the morning, saw the storm, had to get up and go down 38 and see it. This started here, and it went all the way through, I think, Washington, D.C., and it left them without power for a week and a half or two. This is a big derecho that spanned hundreds of miles and had really high winds and left several states without power. Um, they still talk about this one every anniversary. So my favorite part of storm chasing, and the reason I do storm chase um, I do like tornadoes. My disclaimer, don't go looking for tornadoes on your own. Uh, not a good idea. Never drive into the storm. Don't do reckless things. Um, tornadoes come from supercells. They're all shapes and sizes. They can be huge wedges. They can be tiny little ropes. They can be wrapped in rain so you never even see them. Um, they also happen in linear storms, but they'll be completely rain wrapped. You'll never, you'll never see it until it hits you. They're rated by an EF scale, which is an enhanced food Fujita scale, Ted Fujita made a scale um, measuring wind damage. So a certain kind of building takes a certain amount of wind to destroy it. So what the NWS team does after a tornado, they'll go and do a damage survey and they'll find the most damaged thing that they could find. And um, depending on how damaged it is, they get an idea of what the wind speed is. It's not always correct though, um, especially if a tornado doesn't hit that much stuff. The El Reno tornado that had killed some of my friends back in May 31st of 2013, the Dows around, the, the radar trucks around that storm measured up 300 miles an hour wind. They rated that an EF3 because it only hit one structure at an EF3 status, but at one point in time it was 2.6 miles wide and at 300 mile an hour wind. So that exceeds EF5. But they had to rate it the way that they do because it's got to be straight across the board. Um, if you ever do want to see tornadoes, they have tornado tours. They're not cheap, but sometimes they're worth it. There's some that are better than others. If you guys want to ever do one, ask me and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. COD does great one. They're also educational while they do it. You get college credit for it. You learn. Fun experience. And the guys that teach it are fun. They're so fun. And they do really good. Paul Cervalka has been doing it for 25 plus years. He's really good at what he does. Um, you can go next. So, tornadoes do bit, hit big areas. Just because one hasn't barreled through downtown Chicago yet doesn't mean it won't. Just because you live by the lake doesn't mean you're safe from the tornado. Just because there's skyscrapers or valleys or mountains or whatever else that people believe will stop a tornado, it doesn't happen. Tornadoes happen when they want and where they want. And this is my picture of the tornado I had to shoot with my 500 millimeter lens. You can see a lot of the times you have to deal with really difficult things. The contrast was so bad that thank God I shoot raw and that's another thing. You shoot everything in raw. You can fix it afterwards. You have one half here and one half here. So that was a half mile wide. I was still seeing that from really far and this tornado was moving 60 miles an hour. You can see the tornado in this picture too. This was before it got too far and I had a little bit better contrast on it. Um, this is the one that hit Rochelle April 9th of 2015. This was one mile an hour wind speed underneath at five, so I'm not sure why I don't just bump it up, but it's 
to me it's an EF5. It's the biggest tornado you can get. Um, and if it would have stayed on the ground, it would attract through parts of Chicago, upper Chicago. Let's go next. Um, this was a tornado. They don't always look like what you see in the movies. Although this doesn't come all the way down, they had power flashes and it quickly wrapped in rain 30 seconds later and our road ended, so we had to stop chasing. So I got two seconds to shoot the one tornado I got to see. Um, and we had a bunch of trees and hills and all sorts of other difficult things that you come across when chasing. Go next. This was my, so I always had this thing and I wanted my car with a tornado. Well, I got this with my old car, not my Mustang. And that wasn't intentional. Um, I was just my first year chasing. I was chasing alongside with the, the TIB team from Discovery Channel Storm Chasers. Once they kept going, because he's one of the ones that get hit by it, I dropped back and I just kind of gave up because it was pouring rain. So I saw a fire station and I must have forgot what I was doing because I grabbed my camera and locked my car and I walked up to the guy because he had the door open and I'm like, I'm going to stand here. He goes, okay, there it is. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, there it is. And I go, oh my God, I turn around and this is what I see is a huge tornado. <laughs> I was like, there it is. So I run back out and I'm trying to take pictures. The only thing I wanted to do the whole entire year, all the other tornadoes I saw, my first tornado was, I was too close, couldn't take pictures of it. The rest of the tornadoes that night were all in the dark, didn't know what I was doing back then to take pictures of the tornadoes in the dark. So the whole entire season, every time I saw a tornado, it was too far, I couldn't do anything to get a shot. So I finally have this tornado right here. I go to take a picture, camera won't work. Camera wouldn't focus, camera wouldn't do something. So I took the lens off and put it back on, still wouldn't work really like agitated at this point, turn it off, turn it back on, still didn't do it. Ripped the battery out, slammed the battery back in there. I go, if this doesn't work, I'm tossing this into the tornado. It finally worked, thank God. But <laughs> I was not as good as taking storm photos back that first year, because this is a really bad photo, but it's my first tornado picture that I actually got a tornado picture of. Um, so then the guy's like, no, we gotta go in the basement. I go, no, I'm here to chase this. And he looked at me like I was nuts, but I was like, it's okay. And they was cutting back across where the fire station was, so I ran to the back and opened their door so I could watch it go. He was like, what are you doing? I'm like, look. Then I turned around and the tip went the other way, and I'm like, there's got to be another one. I run outside, look the other way, there's another one right there, and I'm like, this is awesome. What next? So this I shot with my 70 to 200 2.8. It was in its dying stage. You could see this tiny little rope. That's usually what they look like when they're dying and they're not rain wrapped. Um, again, not a great picture. Very zoomed in, very cropped. Next. And I'm sure shot at 2.8 too. So that first picture with the supercell I told you I have a tornado. You can see the tornado here. You can see the circulation on the ground. It never fully condensed and it died really fast after that. But if I wasn't this close to this storm, I wouldn't have got that shot. Um, this was probably shot with my 18 and 135. Because I wasn't that close to shoot this with my 10, I wouldn't do that. Um, so we can go next. So this November 17th of 2013 in Indiana, it's my first tornado I saw with my car. I should have backed up a little bit and took a picture. That was my goal, didn't think about it. Um, but again, it's a very, very dark, hard situation um, that if I, I shot too dark to begin with, but because I shot raw, I was able to save a little bit of it. So it's not great. And obviously it's still grainy, but it's there, you can see it. Um, keep going. So again, sometimes you actually see tornado, or you don't see tornadoes, and you get home and see that there was a tornado that you completely missed. Mm -hmm. The guy I was chasing with, I sent him a message, and I was like, you better check your dash cam, because he records out of the front. I thought there was another tornado we never saw, because this is where the first tornado was, and it was dying, so then we're going towards to keep chasing. I never saw that, neither did he. But hey, it's in my picture, so I was excited about it. You find random things that you, didn't, you missed in the first place. And another. This, I wasn't hanging out. I wrap the camera around and I shoot back. Um, again, higher shutter speed, you still got some motion blur from us driving away. Nebraska, big messy supercell. Keep going. For two seconds, it popped out of the rain though. And you can see the one edge of it. This is a tornado on the ground behind us. I never got to see with my eyes. And it only is there because I took a couple shots back out the window. And then again, wrapped up right away, so you never got to see it. Go next. And this is when I saw that second tornado. I was like, you gotta take my picture with this. And I threw in my camera, and he's like, I don't know how this works. I go, don't worry, I put it on auto, you can't mess it up. And I, I think this is the greatest sign. Let's go enjoy a ball game. With that in the background, 
maybe baseball size hail, I don't know. But uh, that was the second tornado in 10 minutes. That I was really, I was really excited to finally get tornadoes like that. Um, that was their last filming day for Storm Chasers too, so it was really cool to watch the episode afterwards. Um, let me go again. That's just another zoomed in picture of that tornado. Um, this is my first Illinois tornado. This is what chasing in Northwest Illinois looks like, or yeah, Northwest Illinois looks like. All trees. I never saw the bottom of it. And if you're not trained to know what's coming at you, you wouldn't know that's a tornado, but that thing was spinning like crazy, and we had one road to get away. It's not always the best to chase in that situation, but I was with people that I trusted, and we got out. Next. That's, again, that tornado. You can see the one dirt road we had and as it's coming up on us. You have to really watch what you're doing and give yourself time to get out. Um, keep going. And again, not a pretty tornado. So this is what people think of as tornadoes. Well, this, um, this is the last time I got to see my friends before they passed away, because they passed away two weeks after this. They were on the same road as us, and like they were facing this way, and we were facing this way, because this is where the storm should have made the tornado. Well, Brad looks back and goes, there it is. Well, it started behind us and started coming across from us. So if you're ever chasing, you have to watch everywhere all the time. Because it wasn't supposed to be able to happen behind us, but it sure did anyway. Um, so this was the start of it. I got out, started shooting it. Um, this was later on as one of its dying phases because it went through a whole bunch of different um, shapes and sizes. It was really cool to watch the whole entire life cycle. Um, nice sunset. It was kind of hard to shoot because the sun was setting. It kind of started happening right as the sun was going down. Um, you can go next. But this is what happened in the middle which is my favorite picture I've ever taken. I enhanced the color on it because I like doing that. But this was rated in EF4. It only hit one structure. Um, didn't kill anybody, didn't hurt anybody. Um, this I have in National Geographic. I've always, if I could have ever got published in anything, that's it. And this is what got published. Um, and I couldn't be more proud, but I want a better shot now. I want another different shot. But um, this is why I chased to sit there. And this was shot at 10 millimeter. You could see all the grass getting sucked in. Because, like I said, the storms suck in uh, the warm air to power themselves more. Go so next. Lightning. Safety is number one. Don't be the tallest thing, which I don't really have a problem with because I'm so short. Um, you shouldn't shoot alone because if you do get struck by lightning, your best chance of survival is the person doing CPR. Um, if you can, shoot from inside the car or building. Uh, one of my friends that shoots lightning, he has a great setup because he has a truck. And he has this window that can just move, and he sets up the tripod in the back of the truck, the four-door. And he can just face back in his truck. Doesn't have to get wet. Doesn't have to worry about getting struck by lightning. Doesn't have to worry about anything. It's just really cool. So maybe I'll do that someday. Next. Um, for lightning, you need a sturdy tripod, a remote release, not a lightning trigger, because that's cheating. Um, you should have radar or data so you know exactly where the storm is and whether it has lightning or not. I have an app that tells me whether storms have lightning because it's a waste of time to go after a storm that doesn't if you're trying to shoot lightning. You need patience, something I really, really lack. Um, a way to keep the camera dry, mine is weather sealed, but I still drape stuff over it and I'm constantly wiping the lens um, so it doesn't get completely um, soaked. You want a location scout beforehand. One of the shots I really wanted to get was lightning over a church called Hotel, uh, church, Baker Church. Um, I tried for months to get that shot, but I had an idea of what I wanted, so every time a storm would come in that area, I would go there and wait. Um, creative shots. Anybody can take a picture of a lightning bolt. I want to get lightning bolts in spots where it's really hard for them to get that shot. But that's what I do. This is one of my first lightning shots I really liked. I was shooting a 10 millimeter. Um, F11 because it wasn't dark yet. This whole thing was rotating, so I was really excited. I thought there would be a tornado, and then it died. But this came down, and I just was so excited. I had ISO 100. Um, I had the shutter open for six seconds before this came down, and I shut the um, shutter. I was bulbing it um, at F11 because they were close, and they can blow out. If they're too, too bright, you'll blow out your whole entire picture. Um, so that's mostly how I do lightning is I bulb it. I sit there with my trigger, I hold it open until I see a bolt I like, and then I'll shut the trigger. Sometimes I'll sit, I'll sit there a couple seconds and nothing happens, I'll just redo the shot. So I, when you're shooting lightning, you're coming out with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nothing but black or overexposed pictures. But then you get a picture like this. It makes it worth it. Go next. This was shot at 10 millimeters. This is not cropped. 
This is not a good place to be. This is like right on the other side of this tree line. Um, I never saw the bolt. I only saw a flash and instant thunder. But again, I had F11 because the bolts were really big and really close to me. I didn't want to blow my, um, overblow it. ISO 100 because Canon doesn't go below 100, at least the one I have. Um, and I had it open for nine seconds before that happened. Go next. This was a lucky shot because I was trying to shoot something in this direction and it wasn't working out. So I got frustrated and just slammed the tripod down, opened the shutter because I knew it was at least my car was there. So at least whatever, whatever happened, happened. And then I saw a flash again, no bolt, instant thunder. And I shut the, the shutter right away and I saw that on the back and I was just like, sweet, this is both the same day. So I got some, all my best lightning shots in that one day and I haven't had great lightning shots since. And that's what happens. This was 2014. Um, you can go next. And this was the shot I waited months to get. For months, I stood outside this church because originally I wanted lightning over those crosses, but when I got close to it, the trees were in the way. And I realized with my wide angle, I can get the whole church in there. So I just stood and I backed off. So after I got those prior two shots you saw, I backed into my driveway when I lived in St. Charles and I saw a lightning spider across the sky and I'm like, great. I'm soaking wet. I'm tired. I have work in the morning like four hours from now, but it's doing what I needed to do. So I had to go back to the church. I was like, nope, going to be there. It took about 10 minutes and I finally got this shot and I was so excited. Um, this, I had a little bit of rain, which you have to post process afterwards. I had to Photoshop and clone stamp and do, it took a lot to make it actually look decent because there was quite a few areas that had rainwater on it that didn't get wiped off between my wipings. Um, but this was ISO 100 F9 because they weren't as bright and this was 10 seconds shutter speed. Um, this is always going to change because like I said I hold it open until either lightning flashes or I feel that it's been open too long and nothing happens so I just restart. Go next. Um, I wanted the picture of me with the radar because I'm a nerd and I took a couple pictures and lightning struck. This is a sh slower shutter speed because you see them kind of blurry. But it was F14, actually, because there was still quite a bit of light out. And about five seconds. I'm not sure why it did five-second exposure. But you see the supercell in the background, lightning, the other supercells back there, and the radar. And I'm getting eaten by mosquitoes at this point because it was horrible mosquitoes. Like I said, bug spray. Um, that was Nebraska. I was in a car garage, so it was nice, and it was, uh, it covered you, so until the storm came, it started blowing rain sideways, and then it wasn't so covering anymore, um, but again, ISO 100, F14, this was five seconds, and then it struck. A friend of mine was actually shooting from down there, has the same exact bolt, so he put that picture up, and I was like, I have the same bolt from a different spot, literally, it was awesome, um, but he was a little bit closer, it was right by, <laughs> right by him, so, but yeah, it was really cool, so next. How much more time? I have a question. Okay. I'm new. Well, not new, but trying to not new. So it's five seconds, and I'm looking at it how long. This is, this is in the handheld, so you have a tripod? Tripod with lightning, always. Okay. Always. I mean, my friend said, like, how the hell is she doing that with the lens? No. Wide angle, tripod, uh, remote release. I found that I get the one that's wireless, because when I sit, I get bored, I chew on my wire. So I went through two or three clickers. <laughs> because I would eat the wire and break them. So I'd chew on it while I'm sitting and waiting. <laughs> so now I get the wireless one so I can't break the wire and I don't have to keep spending money. No, it's fine. No, no. It's always tripod for lightning. So that's the only time I ever use a tripod is because I have to have it not moving. And I leave it open for various amounts of seconds until lightning starts striking. So you can go next. Um, this is in Florida. This is called a bolt from the blue. Um, lightning sometimes strikes up and out of the storm, the top of it. So even though you're not getting rained on or there's clear skies, but you hear thunder, you can still get struck. They can shoot out, I think, 10 miles and strike you 10 miles from the storm. So you still always have to be safe. Go next. Um, again with my car. There was a really cool rainbow and lightning, so I wanted to get the rainbow and lightning. And it was really hard because the sun was setting behind me, making the sky all sorts of weird colors. Um, and the lighting was really hard for this. This took a lot of shots before I actually got this one. This was ISO 160 F11 because of all the sun that I had, and it was a 20 second exposure. You can see some of the, the water got on my lens, and I couldn't fix that as good. Um, but it worked for me. So that not a lot of times you get lighting and the rainbow at the same time. So, next. 
Um, this was later that night, very easy. It's at night, ISO 160, F9, because they were really bright, really close. And you just leave the shutter open until it strikes or until you've waited too long and decide, okay, it might be uh, bad if it does strike. I think I go about 10 seconds max before I get bored and I shut it and restart it. And it's always, once I shut it, then the lightning comes. So <laughs> there's a lot of me screaming at this guy. I ask him, he, he's like, you're crazy. And you don't ever like think about it, but I get really mad. Or I'll move the, the lightning, or I'll move it because all the lightning's here and then now the lightning goes back over there. And that's a lot of patience. You need patience. <laughs> very, very good amount of patience. Next. Again, same thing, same storm. They were crawling across the sky. I like more uh, bolts that come down. But these look kind of cool. Um, these are what I like, but it works. So remember that nice pink storm that I said that decided to have a lot of lightning die when it was by me and then keep having lightning? Um, I got another bolt from the blue. I wanted something called sprites, which shoot way up here. If a really strong storm, you'll have red sprites that come up. You can only see them for like a fraction of a second. They're very rare. Um, I still haven't caught any yet, but you have to be kind of far from the storm, which is a problem for me being a storm chaser because I like to be in the storm. <laughs> so um, that's another bolt from the blue. All right, water spouts is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, they're basically tornadoes on water. I am most successful chasing those. Not as many people go after those. Um, there's a water spout index. I am very good friends with this guy now for the last couple of years. He makes this forecast and I help verify it because he lives in Canada. So he'll have this whole colored map of where he thinks the water spouts will happen. So I'll go to where it's the greatest and I'll just report to him constantly um, the whole entire time. And then he'll relay the reports to get the boaters and all that because um, water spouts can be damaging to boaters. They can come on land. They can still damage. Um, unlike tornadoes, they start from the water and work their way up. As tornadoes come down, um, water spouts are made because of the really warm Lake Michigan. In 2012, we had excessive heat. So the lake was the hottest it's been in a long time. And then that first cold spell that came over, normal amount of water spouts on Lake Michigan is about 70 or 80. In 2012, they had over 175. So that doubled or tripled the amount. Um, they're the safest storm to chase, but you have to stay on land. Do not go on the boat and try to chase them. Although some people in Florida had driven through them, they got in a lot of trouble for doing that. Um, they can still damage you. Water spout season September and October for the Great Lakes because the water is still warm and the first cold air coming down really makes it interact. Um, you want to stay on the beach. The Michigan side is a lot better than the Illinois side. I don't think I've seen many on the Illinois side. All my good ones have been in Michigan. Um, it's just the way the wind fields are over there. Uh, lenses to use. I always have long lenses because these water spouts are always really far away. Go next. Um, so water spouts, if you see a funnel like this, this is a full water spout because they're usually a spray ring. Um, even if you don't see a funnel but you see a spray ring, it still counts as a water spout because like I said, they start from the, the water and work their way up. And a very horrible contrast, it's very hard to shoot these. Um, again, shooting in raw, you can fix it. Um, very high ISO, aperture as open as you can get. Uh, this was shot with my 70 to 200 2.8, just so I can get even more light in there. Um, go on. This is a little funnel, my one little funnel I got over the Illinois side. Um, again, that's a water spout that would be counted as a water spout I'd have to call in. Um, here's a nice little one. This little water spout came down. This is usually where I'm standing to watch all the water spouts, but I was farther down this time, so I got the St. Joseph Lighthouse in it, and I really like that. Um, so you can go next. And again, another St. Joseph Lighthouse, and I've got a little funnel. So there's another water spout, although they're not grand because they're not all the way down. Keep going. Now this one is the best one I got. This is the one that was really close to me. This was in July, which is very rare because they don't happen in July. They just had a really powerful low pressure system come down over the lake, so I got off work and I got to go watch for the water spouts. And this came all the way down to here, so it almost went all the way down. You can see that it has the water spray ring down here, but this was shot with 70 to 200. Luckily, it was very close. So this is going to be the find the water spout game. So this is how far most of the water spouts are that I, I shoot. There's water spouts in this picture. There's two right here. But you can see, if you don't know what you're looking for, most of the people on the beach are running. And I would stop people because I was all excited. I was like, look. They're like, what? I'm like, the water spout. They're like, oh, I see it. She really had to look for it because it was way on the horizon. 
most of the time. Um, so you always want long lenses for this. Go on. So the first water spout I ever saw was this one. And it was first thing in the morning. And the best time to do water spout chasing is right at sunrise and at 4 o'clock and on. Um, just because of the dynamics. The, it's the coldest in the morning and then it's getting cold at night then at that point. Um, this is a random bird that was flying around, kind of photobombed me and I didn't take him out, but next. So this is my coolest water spout picture. Um, this has been shared by lots of people. Um, it was on the news, I was excited about that. Mary Kay Kleiss had shared it back in 2012. Um, that previous picture I showed you said they had two. Well, they break apart and they just keep going. So this had four. Um, a couple other pictures I had had another one starting here. But this was so far away, I was shot with a 300 and then crapped about 75% because it really looked this big in my picture. Um, so if you have a nice big megapixel camera, like one of those ones at 56 megapixels nowadays, this would look great, but this on a 8 megapixel, or no, I had my, this is my 70, my 13 megapixel is not that great. Especially if you don't focus exactly on what it is, cropping it makes it horrible. But I haven't seen this many water spouts since, this is 2012. But we've had a really hot summer, so I'm really excited that we might get a good water spout season. Um, even if you don't get water spouts, you get cool scenes because the waves are always really rough um, those days. Uh, the sun was rising, so it was, it was lighting it up nicely and just, it was really rough. So I got to get really cool pictures without the water spout being there. I always find something to shoot. You got the huge storms that looked like they would make the water spout. They just didn't. They had the little rainbow on the water. It was really cool. Um, so even if I'm not shooting water spouts, I'm shooting something. So it's not a complete wasted trip. Next. And you, know, you sometimes get sunsets like this, which is the coolest sunset, one of the coolest sunsets I've seen. And oh, I really wish, so someone was getting married over here on the beach and they had a photographer. And when I saw this and I go, I hope that God, they're getting this with the couple and the color. And I don't know because I had no clue who they were, but that would have been perfect to be able to shoot a wedding with that in the background. I would be really excited. Um, go next. I don't know what's next. Other clouds. These are gravity waves. Um, just gravity going through the atmosphere, making the waves dip and dive and look like that. That was right down the street from my old house. That was an iPhone panel, actually. Um, next. Mematis. Some of my favorite things. These are the best Mematis display I have uh, saw. It's cold air pockets coming out of the top of the, the anvil. Um, so they bubble down like this. I had a, this is what storm chasing is. You see all the cars, and these are all my friends. They all stop, and they're all taking pictures. Again, I had to include my car and my friends, but next. Uh, more Mamatis. This was phenomenal. This was after one of the Rockford Air Shows. I came home and got to shoot that. I was really excited. Um, but again, this is another one I'm running all over the place to get. Go next. Yeah, I was down here for this. It's not completely in focus, and I realized that afterwards, because I was hand holding this on a rail because I didn't have my tripod. So I tried my best to get the longer exposure and not completely wreck it, but um, keep going. What's it like to be a storm chaser? It's a lot of go, 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 and then wait. You drive countless hours. I have to make the decision at one o'clock in the morning of whether I'm gonna go to Oklahoma because it's a 14 hour drive. I've even had times where I've gotten halfway and then looked at the weather the next morning and it saw that it just fell apart. So then I go to Iowa and go to air show instead, uh, which isn't always the best because I rented a car to go out to, to chase. And there was a lot of tornadoes, but in Colorado, when my target was Kansas, a lot of the times it moves hundreds of miles west. So you have to really compensate for that. If you pick a point, just know that you're probably gonna have to go farther than that. So you really have to watch your timing when you're coming from out here. People in Oklahoma have it easy. They can go to work with my friends and they leave and get tornadoes. But <laughs> that's, uh, I'm not gonna live there and get my house hit by a tornado, but you can go next. Uh, doing weird things to get the shot. One of my friends took my picture. I, they were watching, there was nobody coming down the road, but I lay on the ground to get shot sometimes or I do weird things to get shots. Actually, one of my, my chaser friends that had passed, he does it all the time. So I did this picture. I was like, you gotta take a picture of me laying here because I'm gonna mock the, the he loved that. Or they shoot him, like, it was fun. And he did this a lot. Or I'm bending in, in really weird ways. My friend took a picture really, it was her cell phone, but I was taking a picture of the Cadillac barn with that shelf cloud above it that was that day. Um, but yeah, I've been in weird ways to get storm pictures because I don't wanna just 
be from here because everybody has that view. If you drop down and shoot up, it's a different view. Or if you try to get higher and shoot down, it's a different view. You don't want to have the same view everybody else does because that'll make a picture more interesting. Uh, <laughs> this is fun. Uh, it's very messy. This, that tornado, that nice blue tornado, we were on a complete mud road. Uh, my friend's truck did really well, but he's like, all right, let's go. We got to get in the car and keep following. So I, I go to run and face planted. <laughs> and I had my lens zoomed out too. So I slammed the camera down in the mud and I was like, great. So I got up and tried to go again and I fell on my face again. And I tried again for the third time fell. And I finally got up as like Tim was driving this way. I'm like, he's going to run me. I, met, I messaged him and he's like, I missed you falling. I go, you were driving towards me. You would have ran me over. He's like, oh. Um, but yeah, my, my, this lens is still wrecked because of that. Because some of the mud had dried up and still crackles in there and like messes with my autofocus. But I had Kansas mud stuck in my camera for months before I finally like really cleaned it off. Um, and I completely got mud all over the inside of my friend's truck that day. <laughs> on a seat, on the floor, it was a complete muddy mess. Um, but he didn't mind. We got great shots. Go next. And that's the day I cracked my wide angle lens because on a tripod, always watch your camera. Wind gust comes, face down in gravel, you're done. Mm. Even if you're right through the grabbing, you just miss it by a centimeter. So this is my view a lot of the times. Well, in my Mustang, I had a nice cracked windshield from that baseball sized hail. Thank God that's the only thing it did, didn't dent my car. Um, the cheeseburger is a tribute to one of the guys that died on that, from that big tornado. He used to always have this good luck charm. So he would start the year with the cheeseburger and he'd keep that cheeseburger the whole entire year for chasing. Um, so now all the storm chase is going by when each chase and they let it sit on the dash. Um, GoPro attached to the front. Now I don't know what I'm gonna do when I have uh, my Jeep, but that's the view a lot of the times you got the storm. Got my friend I'm following up there. But you don't want to chase alone, you want to kind of chase in groups. Go next. Um, again, that's the guy that used to chase with them. He just wasn't chasing with them that day. Um, he moved to Illinois now, and he's the one that loves, loves hail, so he'll go through all the hail he can to make his car look like a golf ball. Um, but yeah, you'll see the storm chasers lined up on the street. Usually it's a hundred million times worse than this. Like, you have lines of them all over the place, and some of them like to block the road, or they don't pull off enough, and it's just very crazy. So you want to try to be farther back to not deal with those people, or be way closer than normal to not deal with those people. But you got these storms that are spinning up, and... This is what you see when you chase. Not just storms, you see lots of people. Because a lot more people do this than you think. Um, damage, you have to be prepared to see damage. This was November 17th of 2013. That tornado I'd show you from before, that hit the Starbucks, but they were really good about their whole plan. And the one person got everybody in the bathroom, car went through this, everything was tore apart, and nobody died. And I went back there a year later to visit it, and they have like a little memorial in there showing pictures of the tornado and the damage and all the story of it. It was really cool to see. Uh, we were one of the first people on the scene before the, the EMTs had got there. Spotter training. If you can get spotter training, do it. It's free. They do it in the spring, usually February, March. Um, every county has it. DuPage Severe Weather Seminar is $45 but it's worth it. It's a full day. They feed you and you have presenters from all over the country come in. Um, I like it. I've been there before. The normal training's free. The advanced spotter training, which is the, the severe seminar for DuPage, is, it feels fast. Um, like I said, they feed you and you have a lot of presenters. Being a trained spotter helps your community. Like I said, some of these tornadoes are so brief that by the time the radar goes around, they'll never know it was there. And if it's not for you people being out there, seeing it and calling it into the service, saying there's a tornado here, you have to warn these people, they don't get warning and they get hit. A lot of the times they're out in open land, but still, uh, being a spotter is just, it's awesome, it's great. They use my pictures in the training too a lot, so you'll see some of these pictures in there. Um, safety, like I said, never drive into a storm or a tornado. Storms have large hail, they'll damage cars, they'll shatter your windows, they can hit you and hurt you. Uh, they don't feel good when they hit you. I've been hit by hail plenty of times. If you want to stay on the south side of the storm, you want the rain to be to your right and the, the rain-free base to be to your left. This is all stuff they'll teach you in the spider training. And then you want it to move from left to right in front of you so that you're not going to get impacted by it. You could watch it go by and you're not, you're fine except the lightning that could hit you still. Um, lightning, there's a lot of lightning with storms. The, more str the stronger they are, the more lightning there is. So you really have to watch out. 
Um, do not chase at night until you're fully experienced. It's 10 times harder and more dangerous. I am fully experienced and I still don't like chasing at night. I'll stay way far back. Um, actually, some of my tornadoes this year, I'd given up and we're driving home behind the line of storms and I see a flash and I saw something and I'm like, I think I'm seeing things as I want to see them. And it flashed again and I was like, yep, that's a tornado. And by the time I could stop to take a picture, tornado was gone and I'm like, my life story. Or all the trees in Illinois are right there, like the, the Rochelle tornado. I had the visual of it, and then all the trees were there, and by the time I had no trees again, it was the, the wedge. And I'm like, come on now, really? No trees the whole entire way of 88, it's, or 38, except right there, but it happens. Trees are not storm chaser friends. Um, get covers for your camera and your lenses. If your body is not weather sealed, don't leave it in the rain a lot. Cover it up. They have covers for everything. Um, I just don't use them because it's weather sealed and I, I figure out, I use like sweaters and stuff that I can move really fast to get out. Um, always be aware of your surroundings, always. Next. And thank you guys. These are ways to reach me. Um, CapturedByLorraine.com is my general site. Facebook.com slash CapturedByLorraine is where you see almost all my storm stuff getting um, posted. I, I post my weather stuff, my nature stuff. I post some of my weddings and some boudoir. Uh, my email is capturedbylorraine at gmail.com. I have cards if you guys want them. Uh, is there any questions? And thank you for having me. But is there any questions? No questions. I must have taught very well. <laughs> Come on now. Don't be afraid of questions. I have a question. Okay. You said that the reader takes five minutes to make a sweep. Mm -hmm. Because it goes like this, and it angles up again, and then it angles up again. So it goes through three levels. So to get all three scans to so build the radar. So a tornado lasts like two minutes. Sometimes, yeah. They won't see it? Nope. The last tornado I saw was a couple weeks ago, and they had the ones down that hit Pontiac and then Troy Grove. We saw the Troy Grove tornado. And it literally lasted two minutes because it was right next to us and we stopped and I got out of the car to finally get my tornado shot with my Mustang and by the time I got across the street and faced that way again, it was done. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So I was like, I give up. That's fine. I'm just not going to get the picture with it. Um, but yeah, literally two minutes. That never got picked up by the radar. But you're watching it spin while you're on the ground. So we're very vital to letting the NWS know what's going on. Did you have a question? I did have a question, and maybe it's a stupid question, but... No question, stupid. But how many portrait pictures are you putting in most of those panels? Um... Stitching together. A good... Little bitty slices? Or anywhere what? from five to ten. Okay. So it depends if I start back here, because a lot of the times if I'll face the storm, I'll start back here go through the whole entire thing to about that direction. So I'm doing... So it's 180 degrees up. At least, yeah. Okay. Because, and then, yeah, so I go that way, or I'll, then I'll drop down and shoot it again, or I'll go over here and do the whole process again, or I'll go behind something and shoot the whole process again. So I, always, I literally walk away with hundreds of pictures. Always portrait. Yes. Don't do the landscape, because you'll okay. chop off things that you don't want to chop off. And I learned from that blue shelf cloud I was really sad about, and I never did it again, ever. You don't need a tripod to do it. Photoshop, when you stitch, it yeah. does a pretty good job. Yeah. And I think a new update's coming out that it helps you fill in all those empty spaces while it's stitching it, like automatically. So I haven't used that yet, but I think it'll cut down on things I have to slice off. <laughs> Anybody else have any more questions? No? Okay. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>